our text of scripture, we are carrying along with in Isaiah chapter 6. Uh, I spoke to Pastor David when uh, he suddenly had to go to um, uh, Colorado. It was in my head, but I couldn't read it. When he had to go to Colorado, he said to me, what are you going to be speaking on? And I said, I think I'll carry on with that series that I, uh, that I started, just one, uh, on the kingship of God presented in Isaiah chapter 6. And he said, oh, that's exactly the theme that I am doing in his four-part series that he was doing for Advent. And so I said to David, I'll just carry on with what I'm doing. And so that's what I'd like to do with you here today uh, on one of the three great revelations of God in the Bible. And the second one is from Isaiah chapter 6. I'm going to read that passage of scripture to you. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook, and the voice of him who called at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. So I read for you verse 4, but I only want to speak to you from verses 2 and 3 this morning. The last time that we got together, I spoke to you about the fact that here we see in this passage how King Uzziah is confronted with the reality of the real king, Adonai. That his throne is above every other throne, high and exalted, and his robe is not only longer than all of theirs, but it takes up the entire temple. And that's what it means when it says his robe filled the temple. We also saw that the earthly success had blinded King Uzziah in his kingship. That he thought that because he was this influential king who appeared momentarily in the nation of Israel, that he was therefore some great king who could walk into the temple and decide how things ought to be run. That it is true that before this king... Christians, of all people, know that we are not able to stand before this king, but that only because of Christ's merits can we stand before him. And that's why I ended the previous sermon with the idea that when you and I walk into worship, when we walk into the temple, this house of God that we are all standing on his robe. We are standing only on the righteousness of Christ. That's where we left off last time. But I'm telling you that this is only the beginning of what Isaiah saw. I actually have 11 sermons on Isaiah chapter 6, and we're only on, verse, on the second one. Where we left off last time was halfway through what Isaiah saw simply about the nature of who God is. A constant reality of the nature of the God of the Bible. So first of all, let's look at the next thing that appears. In verse 2 it says, above him were seraphs each with six wings. There are all kinds of angelic beings in the Bible with different functions. There's Gabriel. And if you look up every passage about Gabriel, you'll see that he's always announcing things. He's singing and announcing things. If you look at Michael, what you'll find is that 
especially in the book of Daniel, Michael is always presented as someone who is fighting. In fact, he's the angel in the invisible realm who protects God's people. And then there are the cherubim who guard the way to the tree of life in Genesis chapter 3. There is even an angel called the death angel. You remember when in Egypt God sent an angel, an angel, one angel, into Egypt, and in one night he killed all of the firstborn in that country. There are singing angels, the ones who announced the birth of Jesus. And there are more that we are not even given much information about. Colossians mentions them in this way. For by Christ all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or rulers or powers or authorities, all things are created by him and are for him. Those titles, those terms are referring to the angelic world that was made by Christ and for Christ in the beginning. Then there are Satan and the demons that were at one time angels. But when pride brought them down, they gave into the desire of wanting more than what God had granted to them. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 tells us that we as Christians actually battle in the angelic realm where he says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. If you noticed in the congregational prayer just a moment ago, that's what I was referring to. When I was praying and encouraging you to pray with me, we were praying into the angelic realm that God would not only fight in that realm for us, but that he would give us the strength to fight in that realm as well. There is a great deal more that I could say about this subject, but let's understand that There are different kinds of angels and that each of these angels are designed to do a specific task in the Bible, which brings us to Isaiah chapter 6 verse 2, where Isaiah says he saw angels called seraphim. The first thing that we learn about seraphim is um, that their name signifies who they are. They are seraphs. Or, in the plural, seraphim. The Hebrew word seraph is rooted in the Hebrew word for fire. When you see seraphim, you think of fire. They were angels who were actually on fire. They looked like they were on fire. There was flames licking off of them as they move about, as they do what they are doing. And it's a fire that, interestingly, does not consume them. Rather, it was a fire that was emblematic of their function. Fire, in the Bible, symbolizes holiness, purity, and passion for what is right. We see that when Moses went to the burning bush, that though it was on fire, the fire did not consume the bush. As Moses approached, the voice from the fire said, take off your sandals for this is holy ground. Why was it holy? Because Moses was in the presence of God and that's what the fire symbolizes, God's holiness. Fire in the sense of holiness is also something that consumes one's passions. Do you remember when Jesus cleared the temple with a whip, right? Right? That, that is a way to symbolize that Jesus was being consumed by the holiness of God. And that's what the text actually says. Uh, Zeal for your house will consume me, will be a fire within me. That is the sense we are to get about these seraphs too. They were specially designed by God to love 
recognize and appreciate holiness. So much so that they themselves were on fire. They sang about the holiness of God and they were consumed with it. Our texts that say that these seraphs were, when in relationship to God, above him. What does that mean? This is for a further clarification about the kingship of God, the king that's on this throne. We saw that as that he was high and exalted on his throne. We saw that his robe filled the temple. Now we are seeing his crown. Have you ever seen a picture of the crown kings wore in that day? They were often made of gold, filled with sparkling jewels. In the right light... This is why they had these jewels. In the right light, their, cl- their crowns would glimmer and sparkle as the light bounced off of them. The more gold and jewels, the more glorious the king. Uh, and uh, the, the richer it says that they are. Do you remember when David defeated the Ammonite king in 2 Samuel? It says that he took his crown from their king and its weight was a talent of gold, and it was set with precious stones, and it was placed on David's head. How much is a talent of gold? How much did the crown weigh? It weighed 75 pounds, or 34 kilograms. I don't know how he kept it on his head. It must have been a marvel to behold when When the light shone on such a crown. What was it saying about this king? That he was that great. And when David took the crown and put it on his head, he said, his crown now belongs to me. But no king could have a crown like God's crown. And that's what Isaiah is being told in this vision. That's why it describes the seraphim as above him. These living beings, angels, are his crown. They are not silent gems. (laughs) They're singing gems. They were not jewels set in place by the hands of skillful men. But they were living jewels that God himself created and placed as something to portray and sing of his glory. This crown of God's does not refract light as the sun shines on it. They give off light. They are licking, twisting flames of living beings with voices like thunder that never stopped boasting about the one sitting upon this throne. They adored him and they were never silent about it. Oh, earthly kings had their little singers, you know. They would announce when they walk in a room or when they go through a city gate, they'd have little trumpet players playing away. But no king had singers like these singers. It says a little bit later on, and we'll get to that next time. It says that when they sang at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook. And if you look at the posture of these angelic seraphim's wings, there is a message in their wings. They have three pairs of wings and each set, three pairs and each set tells a different message about the one sitting on the throne. First, it says, with two they covered their faces, meaning that so great was the holiness of the one that they were singing to adore that even they dared not look at him. So they covered their faces. Do you remember the time when Moses said, I want to see you, God. It's in Exodus chapter 34. He says, I want to see you, God. And, And he says, I can't let you see me, Moses. 
I'll, I'll tell you what I'll do. You go in a cliff and I'll pass by, but I'll put my hand over you. And then I'll go by. And after I get by, I'll pull my hand away and you'll get to see my back. Because then it's safe for you. I'm looking out for you, Moses. Such is the holiness of God that anyone not as holy as him cannot survive the experience. What a contrast this is with King Uzziah, who upon entering the house of God, raged at the priests and tried to tell them that there were rules that he could bend and that don't apply to him in the house of God. <laughs> what a contrast. Then they have two other wings. It says, with two they covered their feet. Meaning, that without going into a great deal of explanation uh, as to what is being referred to here, and you could, there's a huge amount of symbolic imagery with them covering their feet. Let me simply say this. Covering your feet is a way of acknowledging your createdness. That you, the one who has feet that are sitting on the ground that you have to walk on, are not divine. Do you remember at the end of Joshua chapter 5, it records that he met the angel of the Lord? And after he realized exactly who it was, it says, take off your, uh, the angel says to him, take off your sandals. For the place where you are standing is holy. Joshua, however great he was, and if there is a great man in the Bible other than the Lord Jesus, it is Joshua. As great as he was, had to acknowledge that he was a fallen man, that he was not holy like God was holy and therefore he was confined to walk on the earth. Which tells us the huge significance to Jesus walking on water. There was something being said when Jesus walked on water about him not being subject to the rules of walking on earth. It was making a statement about his identity. And his disciples knew it. And that's why they were so scared. Lastly, it says, and with two they were flying. The Hebrew word for angel means messenger. One who is sent from God. They're servants of God. Why did these angels fly and constantly fly? The Hebrew word suggests because they were not wanting to land so that they could remain at a state of constant readiness to do the will of the one to whom they were praising. When David sings in Psalm 103 about the angels, verses 19 to 22, that's what he's referring to. That angels are constantly waiting to do God's bidding. And these seraphim, of all angels, refused to land so that they could always do God's will. I want to take a break for a moment from looking at this vision and think about what King Uzziah did when he offered incense on the altar. It's important to remember that this Worship of the seraphs was go was that they were giving it was not just something put on for Isaiah. Oh, Isaiah's coming. Let's do some singing. Let's let's put on a show for Isaiah. It wasn't like that at all. Rather, this was always going on in the temple ever since Solomon built the temple and God's glory descended into the temple. This kind of worship and singing and praising of God was going on and on. And it's, uh, it's 210 years or something like that. This vision happens after Solomon, 
Solomon completes the temple. The nation of Israel saw the Lord descend in it. And it was going on. This kind of worship was going on invisibly. Not Uzziah couldn't see it. It was going on in the temple while King Uzziah was raging about his greatness in the temple and how he's Lord of the temple. While the seraphs were flying in ready service of God, Uzziah looked only to serve himself and display his own authority and glory. King Uzziah was in God's presence, but was oblivious to it. His pride blinded him, and it made him, we might as well say, a practical atheist. Worse yet, it was not just King Uzziah. It was the whole nation that was like this. King Uzziah was simply aping what the nation was doing. So I'm, I've turned to Isaiah. I just want to show you this briefly. Listen to what Isaiah had already told the Israelites in chapter 1, verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom, Listen to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah, you know who they are, right? He's talking to Israel. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings of rams and of the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons and Sabbaths and convocations. I cannot bear your evil assemblies, your new moon festivals and your appointed feast. My soul hates. They have become a burden to me and I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Even if you offer many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Encourage the oppressed. Defend the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. It goes on for five chapters. Israel appears before their God and God is saying, I'm tired of this. And then King Uzziah goes into the temple and thinks that he's the boss. You see, brothers and sisters, true worship of God had disappeared from the whole nation. They had the temple Yes, they had the psalms. Yes, they sang the psalms. Yes, they did the rituals. They did the religious thing. But the one who is enthroned on the temple, in the temple, with the angels singing, could not recognize the hearts of the people who had gathered in his house. That's the point of Isaiah 6. Let's go on to one more thing. Kings <clears throat> in that day, and including European kings, okay? It is part of what it means to be a king to think of yourself as inherently above the people of the nation that you rule over. Including, included in part of that is this idea that the king is above the law. Not all that long ago in England, there was a powerful controversy in the nation of, of England that was summarized in a book 
that was written by a man named Samuel Rutherford, where he wrote a book called Lex Rex, The Law and the King. Meaning, the question became, and it became a very popular phrase in England and in America at the time, was, is it Lex Rex or Rex, is it Rex Lex or Lex Rex? Lex means the law. Rex means the king. So the phrase was saying, is the king the law, that is, over the law, or is the law king and the king is under the law? In our day, we don't realize what a huge battle that is, but the king of England wanted to execute Samuel Rutherford for treason for writing that book. Why? Because the king of England believed that he was above the law, that what he said was the law, but he wasn't subject to the law. And kings often had that battle. There was a debate that carries on even to today. On the 11th of December in 1936, just before World War II, Edward VIII abdicated the throne of England to marry his mistress. But in 1957, after the Second World War was already fought, it was discovered that there was a deal of collusion between Edward and Adolf Hitler, possibly even his willingness to hand over England to the Nazis. If any other British citizen had done this, they would have been executed for treason. So why wasn't Edward? The answer is, is that too often kings are not held accountable to the law. They think they're above the law. It wasn't until Protestantism and Presbyterianism in particular that shaped the modern world that, at least on paper, all, all citizens of a country, no matter what level of government they have got found themselves in, in a position of, are subject to the laws of the land. I remember, uh, we, we, uh, I have a friend who's uh, uh, a judge in Ontario, and he was telling me this story about how uh, the judge was on his way to work, and he was a little bit late, and so he was speeding, and this constable pulled him over. And the judge, when he rolled down his window, said to the constable, you know who I am? And the constable said, yes, sir, I do. He said, well, I'm on, I'm very busy right now, and the constable said to him, <laughs> you of all people should know that speeding is illegal in our country. Nobody speeds through my district. <laughs> and so the judge paid the ticket. Why? Because in a proper democracy, the law is king. The seraphs sang a song about the one on the throne that is high and exalted. And it is from this throne from which the law emanates. And all men are subject to it. Why is God not subject to the law? Because of his utter and perfect purity. He's not like us. He is holy. The first word in the next verse is repeated three times. Not once in the Bible is an attribute of God given this threefold emphasis. It is the one thing that should come into our heads when we think about God. Some people in our world, when they think about God, they exalt an attribute like God is love. You've heard that. Or, God is mercy, and we rest in that. We exalt that his compassion is great. It's true that all of these characteristics can be found in God 
in absolute perfection. But when the seraphs, who are designed to recognize the character of God, reveal the nature of that God, the first thing that comes to their mind above and beyond anything else, what do they say? They say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. When you and I do something wrong, there are laws in place to correct us, to bring us back to a standard that keeps uh, the society healthy and us healthy. God gave the Ten Commandments to Israel to correct their sin and drive them to the Savior because the law comes from God. It is king over us. But for God, there is no law that keeps him perfect. There is no cosmic policeman watching his every move as though there are some Ten Commandments out there for him that someone put in place saying that as long as you keep these Ten Commandments, you can stay God. You see, God is not like us. He is holy, says Psalm 99. When Adam was put into the garden, Adam needed a law to be put in place so that he would not be tempted to think that he was God. The law was God, and the law was put in place by God to constantly remind Adam that he's not God. And if he'd have listened to that, he wouldn't have listened to what the serpent said when he said, if you disobey God, you'll be just like God. God's plan would have worked. You see, God is holy. It is his nature, his love, his being. No one holds him to account in his holiness. He needs no one to hold him to account. The Ten Commandments are not over him, but rather they are a reflection of who he is. God says to us again and again, Be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. When he gives us the Ten Commandments, that we, he gives us the Ten Commandments that we might reflect his image. Not to love and obey them is the same thing as rejecting God. When the seraphs say that God is holy, it means that he is different and separate from them. We are made for the purpose of being his image but we are not meant to be compared to him. We love because he loves infinitely. We are merciful because because he is perfect and complete in it. Our mercy is a reflection of his. We are just, uh, but he is in love with justice. Listen to what Psalm 99 says. The king is mighty. He loves justice. You have established equity in Jacob. You have, Jacob, you have done what is just and right. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. He is holy. God, you see, does not give us this sort of option of which of his characteristics we are to exalt. It isn't as though you and I can say, my favorite characteristic about God is his love or his mercy or his compassion. And that's the only one I'm going to bring up. It doesn't work like that, brothers and sisters. The seraphim knew that. And they say, whenever you think about God, and his character. Remember that the first one you mention is that he's holy. And you're not. But you were designed to be holy. But because we fell in Adam, we are no longer holy. 
Therefore, brothers and sisters, let us have a right view of ourselves before this God. And lastly, when it says in this passage, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, the best way, that's not, even though I love this translation, it's not the best translation of this passage. The best way to translate this passage is, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. That's what the Hebrew says. The Lord of hosts. What difference does that make? It makes a great deal of, in, of difference because the word hosts refers to, quote, numbers. And in the Old Testament, when you talk about the host of someone, it's always their army. It's always their army. That's how we know that what this is talking about is the fact that God has an army. He has an army of angels. Revelation tells us, chapter 5, verse 11 says, that God's army numbers thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. That's a lot of angels. Why did God make so many angels? I've asked and wondered about that. I mean, if you're all powerful, why make all these angels? Besides, if only one angel can put to death all of the firstborn in Egypt in one night, why do you need 10,000 times 10,000? I don't know. I think part of the reason is, is because these angels represent the glory of God or represent the the power of God. He can make these angels. He can make this army. And therefore, the one who makes such an army must himself be powerful. But 10,000 times 10,000? That's a lot. Especially when one angel... Do you remember the battle with Sennacherib? In one night, one angel went out and put to death 185,000 Assyrians? <laughs> Just one. You see, what's going on here, the reason why this is mentioned in this passage is because remember when it said that Uzziah had an army, if I remember the number correctly, it's 307,500 fighting men. And that's part of what led to his pride. Part of what led to his pride was that he had such a capable army. And so he walks into the temple and says, Phew, Nobody's ever seen an army like this before. I must be pretty important. And then he walks into the temple and God says to Isaiah, I'll give you a glimpse of my army. One last thing. You see where it says, the whole earth is full of his glory? What is God saying there? Well, he's again reacting to the kings of earth. One of the things that the kings in the Old Testament often did was boast about how much land they owned, about how many cattle they had, about how much property they owned. You remember King Nebuchadnezzar standing up on his in his castle, standing out, looking over his vast realm, and he says, is this not Babylon the great, which I have built for my glory? Well, God had a way of humbling him. Do you remember what happened? It's very interesting. He, uh, he was up there boasting about the greatness of his temple and God turned him into somebody who thinks they're a cow. That's why he was eating grass. It's an actual illness. People actually get this illness and we have a modern name for it. I think it's boanthropy or something like that. Where people go, you could be subject. Nebuchadnezzar was subject to it for seven years until he finally realized in Daniel chapter 4, 
when he, those seven years were over, it says, at the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? You see, you, Nebuchadnezzar finally came to his right senses. It's Uzziah who didn't come to his senses. The king of Israel didn't know as much as Nebuchadnezzar. And brothers and sisters, you and I, when we boast of what we have, when we boast of the influence, perhaps, that God has given us in this world, when we boast about our education, we boast about our wealth, we boast about our physical health, whatever it might be, when in this world we boast as though the gifts that God has given to us are for our glory and not for his, we set ourselves up as being just like Uzziah. And we are asking God, turn me into a cow for seven years so I learn my lesson and I come to my senses A few, a few years ago, I had the privilege of hearing a talk by Joni Erickson Tata at a Ligonier conference in Florida. I didn't know much about her story at the time, and I'd never heard her speak in person. See, Joni, after a diving accident in 1967, became a paraplegic in a wheelchair at the age of 17 years old, paralyzed from the neck down. It tested her faith in the promises of God to the core. Today, Joni is an internationally known mouth artist, a talented vocalist, a radio host, an author of 17 books, and a worldwide advocate for people with disabilities. In the auditorium that day, there were 500 people and no one was even close to being as well known around the world as Joni, in spite of having spent 50 years in a wheelchair, gone through cancer recently, and over the previous 10 years, having to endure excruciating pain all over her body. When she began to come out onto the platform, there was an immediate standing ovation as she began to speak of how, how thankful she was to the Lord for the ministry that had been given to her and for the strength to stand up under such adversity and most of all for the tender and loving admiration she had for Jesus and his promises. There was total silence Lastly, she said that none of this ministry would have come her way if it was not for her diving accident. If it were not for her being confined to a wheelchair, she would never have had, she said, this great relationship with God. And so she thanked God for his providence in making her a paraplegic When Joni finished speaking for an hour, you could see on her face how painful it had been. And there was an immediate and very long standing ovation. The next speaker himself, an author of many books, a theology professor and an international speaker came to the podium and was lost for words. Then he finally said what all of us were thinking. 
I don't know what to say, he said. We all surely feel like we've been in the presence of a spiritual giant, and we're all midgets. That's the way Isaiah's vision should make it make us feel. Even if we're as rich and powerful as Uzziah, we must guard ourselves carefully that it does not take in our lives, leading us to pride and arrogance. All the gifts that God has given to us should return praise to him like the seraphs in worship, humility, and thankful service to the giver of all good things. Let us understand, brothers and sisters, that it is only because of the blood of Jesus that we have been made right with God and that in Christ you're getting something that you don't deserve that I don't deserve, that in Christ you are getting a treasure that is unimaginable. That you don't deserve and I don't deserve. And when King Nebuchadnezzar boasted that the kingdom was built for his own glory, And God struck him with the disease of boanthropy. He finally came to his senses. Let that be true of us, brothers and sisters. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Oh God, we come before you as a congregation of people. And I'm not so sure I want to pray that you give us the vision that Isaiah had. Because I don't think any of us would survive it. Your glory is too great. And our sinfulness, too much. We don't realize how sinful we are. Not until we see your glory then we realize just how great our king is. But I will pray this, Heavenly Father, and I pray everyone prays it with me, that you would give us enough of an understanding of your glory that we become humble. That we humble ourselves before the throne of God coming to Christ and understanding that it is only because of his blood that we are made right with such a God. And if we have harbored pride in our hearts, expose it for us, Father, before that day when we stand before you in judgment and it's too late, Give us enough understanding of your glory to destroy our own pride. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.